It is my great pleasure to introduce Professor James M. Lang as our keynote speaker for the forum. Professor Lang earned a bachelor's degree in English and philosophy from the University of Notre Dame in 1991, a master's degree in English from St. Louis University in 1993, and a PhD in English from Northwestern University in 1997, where he then served as the assistant director of the Searle Center for Teaching Excellence for three years. He joined the faculty at Assumption College in 2000, where he's currently professor of English and the director of the Center for Teaching Excellence. Professor Lang is the author of five books, the most recent of which are Small Teaching, Everyday Lessons from the Science of Learning, the topic of his keynote today, Cheating Lessons, Learning from Academic Dishonesty, and On Course, a week-by-week -week guide to your first semester of college teaching, the last two from Harvard University Press. Professor Lang writes a monthly column on teaching and learning for the Chronicle of Higher Education. His work has been appearing in the Chronicle since 1999 on topics such as teaching via podcasts, building a better discussion, and designing syllabi, among other topics. His book reviews and articles on higher education have appeared in a variety of newspapers and magazines, including the Boston Globe, Chicago Tribune, and Time. Professor Lang has conducted workshops on teaching for faculty at more than 50 colleges or universities in the US and abroad, and we're very excited to have him as our keynote speaker this morning. Please join me in welcoming Professor Lang to St. Joseph's. If um, you don't have an index card, if you could raise your hand, I can hand some out. Thank you. So thank you. Um, I'm glad to be here, especially because I can now add to my CV the fact that I've spoken in a teletorium. I don't know what that means, but I'm excited about it. Um, I also didn't get a name tag, and I'm going right from here to my 25th college reunion. So this is one time it might have been useful for me to actually get that name tag. Um, so the index cards are going around. If you didn't get an index card, grab one. We're going to do something with those index cards um, here at the beginning and then again at the end and designed to kind of help you think about um, what you might want to take away from this day. Um, so uh, I'm glad to be able to talk to you about um, small changes that you can make to the, your courses. And um, I hope that you can come up with some small changes that you'll be able to make to your courses, not only from this talk here, but also from the next sessions that you'll be going to. Now, the premise of the talk is that we can use small changes uh, to our classes, to our communication with students, to our course design, um, that can have a powerful impact on students. And I'd like to illustrate that by telling a, a story uh, about that happened while I was writing the book. Um, as I was saying to some people outside earlier, I have five children, so if I want to get anything done, I have to leave my house to, to do my writing. So every day I would go to the same coffee shop to work on this book. I was on sabbatical. Um, and so I would um, walk into the coffee shop every day, and I'm sort of a person of routines when it comes to food and drink. So every day I would order the same thing. Um, which was a medium green tea. I'd walk in and say, you know, medium green tea. And the barista would say, would you like it hot or cold? I would say hot. He'd say, would you like any honey or lemon in it? No. Now, this went on every day while I was writing this book for like three months. And every day when I walked in, um, she sort of asked me, looked at me as if she'd never seen me before, and asked me, you know, the same two questions every time. So after about three months of this, um, one day I was feeling a little mischievous. And it was Friday, and um, so I walked in, and, and she said, can I help you? And I said, can you guess? And she looked at me and said, um, oh, I'm blanking. Um, and then I felt really bad, so I was like, no, it's OK, it's OK, green tea, hot with nothing in it. Um, and so that, you know, I got my tea and did my work that day. And then um, th that was on a Friday, I think, and I came back on a Monday. There's about 10 feet between when you walk in the door and when you make your order. And I walked in the door, and even before I got to the counter, she pointed at me and said, green tea, hot with nothing in it. And I said, no, decaf latte. <laughs> no, I didn't. No, I didn't. Uh, um, so um, from that point on, she remembered my order for the rest of the time that I went there. And the, I like to use this story to illustrate this very simple point. Every day I was walking in and giving her the same piece of information over and over and over again, and she never remembered it. I made one slight change to our interaction one time 
which was to ask her to try and remember it herself. And once I did that, she was able to remember that piece of information the rest of the time that we interacted. Now, that's a very simple piece of information that she was trying to remember. But as you're going to see in a few minutes, asking people to practice remembering things, it turns out, is the best technique we know of to help people remember things. And that includes not only simple facts, but complex skills as well. Cognitive skills, thinking skills, all the kinds of stuff that we want students to be able to do when we ask them to uh, perform on our assessments, whatever those might be. So these kinds are the kinds of simple changes that I'm going to sort of argue with you about uh, what we can do. And the premise of the talk is this. You can see that cup of green tea there. Um, this is from a great book called Make It Stick, um, which was published two years ago by Harvard University Press. It's the best book on learning that I know of today. Um, and very well written by two cognitive psychologists who teamed up with a novelist um, to, so that they could you know, have a, a, a very well written and, and easy to comprehend book. Um, and this is their argument as well. Uh, and so it's one that has been very inspirational for me as well. That a lot of what traditionally we've done in higher education hasn't been the most effective ways that we could be helping students learn, but some comparatively simple changes can make a big difference. So that's what I'm going to argue with you today. Now, um, what I hope that we can take, that you and can take away from this session um, are three basic things here. Uh, I'm going to try to convince you of the power of small changes. So I'm going to show you some laboratory studies. I'm going to show you um, examples of techniques um, that I've seen people use that have made a, a powerful difference in how their students learn. So that's part of what's going to go on. That'll be sort of throughout the whole talk. I'll be trying to convince you that, of the power of these small changes. Um, I'm going to show you three learning principles that I think can be used to guide small changes. Because um, we don't want to just make small changes for the sake of making them. Um, and I think we have good evidence from the learning sciences about some productive ways to think about how to make small changes. And so I'm going to show you three of those. There are ultimately nine of them that are addressed in the book that this talk comes from. Um, if you want the other six, you have to buy the book. Um, but you're going to get three for free. So, um, so we'll, we'll work on specifically on three of those. And the last and most important thing here is that this is designed to start a conversation. Obviously, I'm only here with you for a very short time. Um, and so my goal here is to try and ultimately start a conversation that will continue um, in the next sessions as well as after um, this is, event is over and you continue to think about how you want to develop as a faculty member. Um, and try to empower you to think about the fact that you know, you don't have to revolutionize your teaching, um, you know, if things aren't going as well as you like. Thinking about how you can make one or two small changes each time out um, can ultimately have a really big uh, and powerful and positive influence on your teaching. So, um, these are the learning principles that are covered. So these are the sort of nine learning principles that I mentioned. And you can see the, the middle ones are the ones that we're going to work on. Um, and so we're going to talk specifically about the idea of how do people retrieve knowledge from their memory and put it to use. Um, and that's something that's, um, both of those parts are important. Okay, so we, we have, students have a lot of access to information these days, but we do know from a lot of research in cognitive psychology that people need to be able to have foundational knowledge in their memories to be able to do complex high order types of thinking. So that we're going we're gonna to talk about that. Connecting, oh, by the and so the, these uh, fall into these broad three categories. How do we help people get stuff into their memories that they can use. The second thing is how do we help them improve their understanding um, by practicing skills, by making connections, um, using self-explanations, which is a, a great uh, learning tool. And the last part there is inspiration. Uh, all the great teaching techniques in the world aren't going to do us any good if, we don't, if students don't feel inspired to learn. So what I've done is, uh, for this talk, identified one from each of those three categories. But you can see the sort of broad scope there, and if you have questions at the end, we'll have plenty of time for um, discussion and conversation after I'm done talking. Uh, you want to ask about any of those others, that's fine as well. And by the way, so our talk here also is going to be a, a conversational. Um, I'm going to pause two or three times to ask for questions or to ask you to think about something. Um, and you can raise your hand at any point to interrupt me. Um, and then I'll also leave time at the end for us to talk um, together. OK, so what do I mean by small teaching practically? Um, practically, what I am going to be recommending today are three types of small teaching changes to you. The first are five to 15 minute interventions into a class period. And as you're going to see, I especially like to focus on the opening and closing minutes of class. 
I think these are really rich opportunities um, to help enhance learning in student, uh, for students that are often kind of frittered away because you know we come in and we're fooling around with the technology um, or you know we're just kind of um, getting ourselves put together and kind of hemming and hawing our way into the class period. And I think those are actually really rich periods. Uh, at the beginning, at the end of the time of class period, we're often kind of rushing to get in like the last four points I forgot to make, right? And so we're doing a lot of that at the end. Um, so I think that if we can think really deliberately about those opening and closing minutes of class, um, that can have a powerful influence on what we do. And also the opportunity for small activities um, that, that break a class up. So, so I'm gonna focus on this idea. Secondly, um, by small teaching, I mean sometimes a limited number of things that you could do over the course of a, a, a course. So that, uh, a technique or a strategy that you might try only one or two or three times during the semester, but one that we know will have a positive impact on student learning. And the last thing is minor changes to course design, the assessment structure, the broader sort of package of assessments that you put together, um, or how you communicate with your students. Uh, and so you're gonna see the last uh, this is actually kind of um, going to follow the, the three different things. The first thing that we're going to talk about is focus more on that first one. The second thing will be the um, more limited number of innovations. And the last thing we'll be talking a little bit about course design, which is great. A lot of times I'm giving this talk in like, you know, October, and people can really only take away, you know, the small things they can do. But you all are um, at the point where you can think about making some small changes to the courses that you're going to be teaching next semester um, so that, that you'll have the opportunity to think about all of these things. Okay, so you have your index cards. And I'm only gonna ask, I'm not gonna ask you to do anything weird like tell me what kind of teaching animal you'd be if you were a teaching animal, I promise. Um, so, uh, but the, I wonder, we're gonna do something very simple and that is this. I just want you to write down on one side of the index card, I want you to just have one course in mind. So I want you to, I'd like you to have just one course in mind that you would like to maybe try and make some changes to next semester. You likely came here because you have something that you would like to do and work on. Um, you have some course that maybe didn't go perfectly. Uh, and so what is that course? Um, and so you kind of will have this in your mind as, you, as you're listening and as you're walking through the rest of your day um, trying to gather ideas. If, if, this were, if I were in your position, this is what I would write down. Um, in my Brit Lit Survey 2 course, which is what I taught in the spring, I'll be teaching in next spring. It just sounds exciting, doesn't it? Britlet Survey 2. Um, I always, it's, it's one of those courses that, you know, it's a survey, so you're supposed to be sort of covering all this stuff. Uh, and, I, my, and I always have to fight against that and try and challenge students to come up with their own interpretations of work rather than just sort of saying, here's the poems, here's what they're about, let's move on, you know, it's Wednesday, let's go to James Joyce, it's Friday, let's go to Virginia Woolf. Um, so I, I have to kind of fight it. So this is what I would write down. Now you can write down whatever you want. <laughs> so I'll give you one minute to write that down. What's a course you would like to make some changes to? And what might you like to change or improve? Okay, so with that course in mind, um, you know, we're gonna walk through our three things now. I'm gonna get, go through each of these three things. We'll take 10, 15 minutes for each one. We'll pause a little bit after each one for questions and discussion, um, and then have time at the end for overall questions and discussion. So uh, we're gonna start by the idea of retrieving um, knowledge from, um, the idea of retrieval, which has gotten a lot of press lately in the higher education literature. And I'd like to start this um, part of it by telling you about a great experiment that took place. It's one of my favorite higher education experiments. 
So this was conducted by um, one of the guys that wrote that book, Make It Stick, Henry Rodiger. And he brought students into a lab, he and his colleagues brought students into a laboratory and asked them to memorize 40 English and Swahili word pairs. Okay? So a lot of times these learning uh, um, lab research starts with people trying to memorize word pairs because it's an easy way to kind of uh, test people's memories. So they brought these students into the laboratory and asked them to memorize these word pairs over the course of a single day. And over the course of this day, they had four sessions uh, in which they could memorize the word pairs. The first was, uh, in each of these four sessions was similar. They had a, like a 45 minute study period and then they took a test on the word pairs, okay? So over the course of the whole day, um, they did this. And then at the end of that day, um, they had all memorized all the word pairs, okay? But they brought them back a week later to see how many of the word pairs they could still remember a week later. Like testing for sort of more long-term memory. Now, in the first, um, they did it in four different conditions, though. In the first condition, the students had all 40 word pairs on all four of the tests, in all four of the study lists, as well as on all four of the tests they took, okay? In the second condition, whenever the students got a word pair right on, the, uh, on one of the tests, it dropped off their study list, but it stayed on their tests, okay? In the third condition, just reverse that. Every time they got a word pair right, it dropped off their test, but it stayed on their study lists. And in the fourth condition, every time they got a word pair right on the test, in the future ones, it dropped off both their study lists and their tests, okay? So again, at the end of the day, the difference between these conditions didn't matter because everybody had gotten the word pair correct at some point along the way. So the results I'm gonna show you now are the results that they, when they brought them back a week later. So the first one was the test and study condition. All 40 word pairs occurring in the tests and in the study lists, and they were able to get 80% of them right a week later. In the second condition, remember they stayed on the test, but they dropped off their study list, so they weren't able to look at them anymore after they got it right one time. And here were the results a week later. Hmm, yeah, I like that, I like that. <laughs> hmm, interesting. Now I'm gonna swap to the fourth condition, which is when it dropped off both their tests and their study conditions. As you can imagine, there's a big difference here. We're down to 33%. And I like to save this third one for last, because this is when it was dropping off their tests but staying on their study conditions. Even more of a hump there, right? So the idea here is that what was making the difference in helping these students learn these word pairs was not the studying. After the initial study period, which was brief, it was the tests. It was the tests that were actually helping them remember the words. This is an effect called the testing effect, which is so I like to call retrieval practice because you don't have to use tests to take advantage of the principle that is what is underlying this. And the principle that's underlying this is the same one that I told you about in that opening story. If we want to remember something, the best way we know to do that is to practice remembering it. And tests are practice memory exercises when we think about it like that way. So are quizzes, right? But they're not the only way that we have to do that, which is why I don't like to call it the testing effect, but instead to think about it as retrieval practice. And so if we want students to try and be able to remember foundational knowledge that they're gonna be able to work with when they're doing the stuff that we ask them to do, the best thing we can do, the most help we can give them, is to give them retrieval practice. Not only should we be doing that by giving them homework, but I think they need the kind of help that we can give them with that in class. Now, why does this happen? For each of the three things that we're going to talk about, I'll give you a little bit of background theory about, like, why does this happen? Michelle Miller is a cognitive psychologist from Northern Arizona University. He wrote a great book called Minds Online that came out from Harvard a couple of years ago. Um, and Miller argues this, that it used to be the case that we thought that, you know, we had, the challenge of memory was getting stuff into it, uh, and that it was a limited capacity. But now, um, the thinking seems to be that our long-term memories actually are much, much, have much greater capacity than we ever envisioned. In fact, um, some folks say that we haven't yet reached the understanding of what the limits might be. The challenge is not getting stuff in there. It's getting stuff back out again when you need it. 
So she uses this nice analogy. It's like having a vast amount of closet space, right? It's, there's, it's, there's a lot of room to put stuff in there. The challenge is getting stuff out when you need it. And as a simple little illustration of this, uh, I heard a cognitive psychologist tell this, uh, give, give this example once. Um, like a lot of you, um, I've lived in a lot of different places in my life, and so I've had a lot of different phone numbers and stuff, right? And if you asked me to recite all those for you right now, I could not do that, right? But if you gave me a list of like 100 addresses, I could pick out the places, I, the addresses I lived at, right? So that information is there, but it's not easily retrievable by me because I don't use it anymore. So but your regular address you use frequently. You have to write it down on forms and all that stuff, right? So, that, so you know that. So this idea that we have to continually retrieve things that are important to us. Now, this is about as neuroscience-y as an English professor is able to get. Um, this is Dan Schachter. He's a Harvard neuroscientist who wrote a great book called The Seven Sins of Memory that this quote comes from. And what Schachter tells us here is that memories are basically, um, you know, modifications and connections amongst neurons, and I'll show you a slide of that later. Um, and when we experience something new, uh, some kind of, and we want to, so we have something that we've learned, um, they form these new connections, and those dissipate over time unless they've been strengthened by subsequent retrieval and recounting. And that's what strengthens the memories that we have. And not only, again, memories for just facts, as I'm going to talk about in a minute, but memories for more complex things as well problem-solving skills, writing skills, speaking skills, um, critical, all the kinds of stuff that we want people to do. This is true for all of these types of things. Now, in order to help make that case, I'm going to show you one other study in this area. So this was a study that was done in which the um, researchers asked students to come into a laboratory and listen to art history lectures. And then they were tested on that material 30 days later. And this was designed to see, like, simulate a more regular college experience, right, where you might get the material in week two and then, you know, take a midterm on it in week six. So they wanted to see what was going to help students remember that material over that long span of time. So what they did is they had three 30-minute art history lectures. And at the end of those lectures, they did one of the students did one of four things. They either just walked out. When the lecture was over, they were done. That's condition one. Condition two, they had a focus study sheet that they got that they could look at, which highlighted the key concepts and terms. Condition three, they took a multiple choice quiz on the material just after the lecture. Number four, they took a short answer test on the material where they had to write out their responses. So again, here are the 30-day results. If there were no activity out whatsoever, they were able to remember about 20% of it. 30 days later, which is kind of depressing, right? <laughs> um, so now keep in mind, though, they had no opportunity to study the material in between in that interval. Um, focus study helped up to 36% with focus study, um, which is good. So it, the other study suggests, you know, there's kind of implication that, that studying does absolutely nothing, which um, I think is maybe an oversimplification. This, this one suggests that studying the key concepts did help the students. It helped about as much as a multiple choice test, taking right after the, at the end of the um, period. But as you can probably imagine, because I'm saving it for last, and because this slide is called Thinking to Retrieve, <laughs> it was the short answer that made the biggest impact. So asking students to answer some short answer questions right after they've been exposed to the material for the first time more two and a half times they were able to perform on this 30-day assessment. So there are lots and lots of research which suggests that this is the case, that especially immediately after exposure to new material that we're trying to learn, if we're asked to recall it, retrieve it, work with it, do something with it, and that's why I like this one in particular, because it's not just about memories, it's also about doing a little bit of thinking, um, that that is really powerful. Yes, we have our first question. Yep. And how was the 30-day assessment? Like, do we still have this information? I think they don't have Yeah, no, it was like a quiz. It was a quiz and uh, it was like a, a test or a quiz 30 days later that they took. Was it a short enough grant? Yeah, they all matched. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, now, so 
there's a great uh, website called retrievalpractice.org, which has a lot of interesting research on this. I'd, I'd recommend looking at it. It has a lot of specific techniques and tips. And one of the things that um, that website tells us is this, that oftentimes, again, just repeating a little bit, that we think about learning as you know, helping students get the information. And students often think about this as well. And so they study by rereading their textbooks, highlighting information, reviewing these notes. And so oftentimes the thinking here is about, again, getting stuff into my memory, right? But what all this research is telling us, and what you'll see a lot of on that website, is this. That retrieval practice makes learning effortful and challenging. And that's a good thing. That we want learning actually to be effortful and challenging. That's when we tend to remember stuff. When it requires mental effort. The problem sometimes is that initially it's hard. And that's why students would rather review their notes than actually sort of test themselves, right? Which is what we know is actually much more helpful to them. Um, so they engage in these things. But we don't have to support that, right? And so one of the things that we can do is be, give them a taste or experience with this kind of practice in our classes, OK? The more difficult the retrieval practice, the better it is for long-term learning, which gives us an opportunity to think about what we want to do in our classes um, asking students not only to just remember things, but to work with them, to solve problems, to, appli to apply, to think creatively with the stuff that we're asking them to learn. Yes? Uh, what was your retrieval and retrieval comment? Yeah. Is there, are the studies comparable in, in distance or short distance that they are allowed to have access to their books or books that they were allowed to Very good question. Um, it's, it does not, it's not, it's, so if the way that the cognitive psychology people will say is this, um, Dane Willingham is, is from um, University of Virginia who has a great um, book about this. Um, essentially thinking, like doing creative and critical, all that stuff, is combining stuff in our working memory from the environment and from our memories. If either of those two things is shallow, the thinking is shallow. So like it actually is really important for students to have stuff that they can draw from their memories rather than just looking at it. An easy example demonstration of this is students who have their math facts memorized are able to perform better on higher order math than the students who do not have those math facts memorized. And there's lots of other research that shows something similar. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think anything is going to be better than nothing, right? Like small teaching here, right? Um, so, you know, there's all each of these four part, three parts are going to finish with a practical suggestion slide. So let's, yeah, hang on. <laughs> but I like the enthusiasm. Um, OK, so, um, so here's, a, here's my first good example, actually. So this comes from a math professor um, whom I worked with um, on her teaching. And actually, in a sort of good demonstration of the small teaching principle, this was a person who kept coming to me um, and asking me, you know, say, I want to do inquiry-guided learning. I want to do pro problem-based learning. And I want to do all this other stuff. And, and, and every, I'd see her every semester say, oh, no, I didn't have time to revise my courses like that. So finally. I, you know, I said, talked to her some about this, some of this research and suggested, why don't we try something small? Um, and this is what she did. At the end of every class period, she had her students get out an index card and write down the most important thing they learned in that class period. Now, this is a thinking activity because it involves a little bit of judgment, right? What was the most important thing in that class period? And all they did was write it down. I think this is algebra. Is this algebra? Anybody? Linear algebra, yes. So this was linear algebra. Um, and so all they did was write down the single most important thing they learned from that class period. And that's it. Sometimes she would say, a few of you tell me what it was. Sometimes she would collect them and look at them just to make sure that they understood what it was, the most important thing, and sometimes not. She would just let them keep them. And they had them again at the end of the semester as a quick way to review what was the key idea from every class period. Okay? Doesn't have to be done with index cards, but this was a simple demonstration of the effectiveness of this. And she said it made a huge difference in her students. Um, they were able to do much better at the end of the semester um, on the final exam when they, than when they had not done something like this. 
Now, before I show you that practical slide, the one thing I just want to reiterate again is this is not just about facts. Right? It's Dan Willingham is that guy I just mentioned, actually, um, who his book is called Why Students Don't Like School. Um, and it's actually aimed more at K-12 educators, but it has a lot of great stuff in it. Um, and so Willingham makes the point that this is true for skill development as well. Okay, so whatever it is that we want students to learn, I keep turning my back on you. You're the one person, good student that sat up front, and as a result, you have to look at my back the entire time. Um, so as there, anything that we want people to develop, um, we have to give them this retrieval practice. OK, so each of these three parts ends with what I call the money slide, which is the practical application slide, uh, and try and give you some suggestions for what I think this might look like. So first of all, we oftentimes come into class and say, so here's what we did last time. This research would suggest something a little bit different. And that is to walk into class and take five minutes to say, let's remember what we did last time. Right? Can we take five minutes and I would like you to remind me what we did last time. Now, the first time you do this, what they're going to do is, uh, hold on a second. Right? That doesn't help. So you have to sort of get them into the habit where you say, we take the first five minutes to review what we did last time. This is a notebooks closed activity. Let's work together to try and get it. And you'll find they can do it. It's, but it's challenging at first, because the first thing that's going to happen Actually, that's the second thing that happens. The first thing that happens is this. Uh, what did we do last time? You're like, were you here? Like, I spent 45 minutes on this, right? Um, so, but that's okay. Don't get frustrated. Um, I, I, they get better at it. And they, they, they you know, it's a, it's a simple little activity that you can do to start class, like in a group brainstorming way, right? To sort of put things up on the board and, and start um, by asking them to do that review rather than you doing it for them. Close class, simple, just like my colleague did with the index card, right? You can close class. This is a very, uh, lots of people have written about this thing called the minute paper, where you write down the most important concept for the day. And some people add to it, what's the one question that you still have about today's discussion or material or thing that we have worked on, right? And it's a great not only for re retrieval, but it's also good to give you a sense of what are people taking away from this. Right? What, are, what are they getting my main point? What questions are there? So you can collect these. You don't have to collect them. You can grade them. You can not grade them. All those are options that um, people can think about how they want to do that. Um, obviously, you can do the same thing that we've seen in these studies, which is asking, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, just let, me, should I, let me just do these last two, and then, yeah, yeah OK. Um, so you can obviously ask students to um, do something like we saw in any of these studies. And I know this is like counterintuitive, right? Like, they, I just taught it to them. Why should I ask them to take a quiz on it? And all I can tell you is the research is real clear on this, that, that an immediate use of the thing, immediate opportunity to retrieve is like really an essential foundational thing to do, um, that that quick thing right after the first exposure is really important. I've observed another teacher that I thought did something really interesting. He opened class by putting four questions on an overhead and said, these are the questions that we'll be discussing, to, that, that um, the answers to these questions form the basis of class today. And so they were exposed to the questions at the beginning. They saw the questions. And then at the end, he put the questions back up and asked them to remind him now, what are the answers to these questions based on what we've talked about today? So it's a great opening activity, too, because um, we, the, I don't, the, one of the things I showed you was, um, the prediction, like asking people to predict or speculate about something before you learn it is actually a really helpful learning activity. And so that prediction activity at the beginning, here's the questions, what do you think, can then be reinforced by the retrieval at the end. Now tell me again, how, did you, how would we answer these questions based on what we've talked about today? You can do that with one big question, two. My colleague uses four. Um, but you obviously can do this in lots of different ways. OK, speaking of questions. So the only reason I, I like kind of like the index cards and why I'm asking you to use them today, for example, is because it keeps the idea that you've got to make a judgment about what you, what you can only fit one thing, really one thing on there, right? Um, and so it, it forces you to, you to do a little evaluation. Now, you could certainly still do it in their notebooks, but um, I just like the sort of symbolic nature of that idea that, um, you know, you, you can only put in here what you can fit on here. And so you've really got to think about, like, what was the most important thing for today? But that's, it's just, you know, it's like a tech tool, right? I mean, it, 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 could, it could certainly be different. And you could certainly just have them do it in their notebook. Yes, sir? Oh, 
Oh, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, um, the story I like to tell about this is, um, I, when I, so I've made all of these changes to my teaching in the past two years based on all this research. And uh, when I first did this one, um, so I teach, I was telling you, I teach Britlet survey too. And so the first author we read is Scottish and, and it, it's Robert Burns. And it's, it's kind of important that there, you know, when you're teaching Britlet survey, you're looking at Scottish authors and Irish authors. And, um, and so the, the ethnicity is kind of important where they come from. So we talked a lot about the fact that Robert Burns was Scottish. And then like a few weeks later, we were looking at another author and I was starting class and I said, oh, this author is Scottish. Um, remember the other Scottish author we read? And I was like, what am I doing up here? Like, what is the point of me if we spent like a whole class period talking about the fact that this guy was Scottish and it, it like in, influences poetry. And so, so that's what I had to learn, <laughs> that you have to be patient, right? But if you are patient, they can do it. They can do it. It just takes a little, it's effortful. That's what that slide show you, right? It's gonna be a little bit effortful, but that effort pays off. Because then if they've remembered it once in class, they're so much more likely to be able to remember it when they come to your final exam. Or when they're working on a project or paper um, that that might more easily come to them. Okay, yes. You mean, um, what did you say, Socratic? Did you say Socratic? Oh, oh, oh yeah. Um, I mean, I think. Yeah, I don't, I'm not sure. Um, I don't know, actually. Um, I like the idea of doing it very simply and asking everyone to do it in class just because. It ensures that everyone does it. It kind of gets around, um, you know, just having everyone sort of do a quick little writing. I'm a writing teacher, so I kind of favor um, having students do things in writing. But um, for the end thing, I kind of do like the idea of having them, everyone do individually something in writing that, you know, can be collected or not collected, just because it ensures everyone does it. Um, it, it forces everyone to sort of uh, retrieve it from their own memories and do something with it. Um, so you could certainly, as you were, to get to your earlier question though about Blackboard or having them do it afterwards, um, you know, that can certainly help. The challenge there is you don't know if they're going to just pull out their notebooks to answer the question, right, which is going to be not as helpful. Um, you have to try to get it out of your memory first in order to, for this, to have this positive effect on your teach, on, your, on their learning. Okay. Any other questions on this one? We're going to move on to our second one um, in just a second here. Any other questions on this one? Okay. Boy, well, did you have a question? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. No, actually, um, as long as everybody sort of gives it an initial try, like thinking about talking to your partner and helping each other would be, I think, absolutely fine. Um, so, you know, pose, if you, if you sort of pose the question or give them the task or whatever, and they kind of work it out by talking, at least, the, you know, they're giving a sort of an individual trying, um, they're, if they're both trying to do it, but talking to each other, that's fine. There's actually interesting research that shows that even non-articulated retrieval practice, like just trying to think about it without writing anything down, does have a positive impact. The challenge is if you just ask people and you they don't have, you don't know if they're actually thinking about it, right? It's so like when you ask them to write about it or talk about it or something, then you know that they're actually doing it. But I think doing it in teams or pairs is absolutely fine. I think it would have the same positive impact. Okay. All right. Let's move on to our second big. Uh, idea here, and that is connecting. So this comes from our the second big category of stuff, which is deepening people's knowledge, thinking about understanding, um, how to apply something you've learned in, in, in class to like your uh, another context, uh, how to apply stuff that you've learned in, in a class to the world around you and when people get out of school and all that stuff. Uh, and so connecting is, is the way um, that cognitive psychologists tell us is how learning works and how we make, uh, how learning works in our, our brains is that we are forming connections between the different things that we know. The more we know, the more connections we have between all the different things that we know. And that's essentially what knowledge looks like. So um, this guy, um, George Orwell, is one of the people that I teach sometimes. And um, he wrote a novel called The Clergyman's Daughter. You probably all know 1984 and Animal Farm, right? He wrote like 
a dozen other novels. Um, they're not that great. But this one, um, I was reading while I was doing this research, and this quote popped out at me, because this book is about a school teacher that um, gets amnesia, uh, wakes up you know, uh, on her own in London and becomes a school teacher. Forgets everything she knows, so she becomes a teacher. Interesting. Um, so, so when she first encounters her students, though, at this small rural school she goes to, this is what she thinks about them. And this quote really struck me because this is exactly what learning researchers tells us, tell us looks is, is what is ex happening in the mind of a novice learner in any discipline. That this is what they have in terms of their knowledge. They have it in disconnected islets. Uh, things, they know things in isolation. And that is the difference between you and them, is that they have knowledge in all these little separate put away parts that they can't connect. Whereas you connect everything you know. Like when you're out doing stuff, right? Like in walking around in the world, you're thinking about how things connect to your discipline. When you're watching television or seeing a movie, you might see connections to your discipline. When you're teaching one class, you, you might see connections to another one, right? So you're constantly doing this. They don't have that capacity yet. And so one of the things that we want to think about doing when we're thinking about how to improve student learning is how can we help students get over this and become more like us in their ability to form connections between the different things they are learning. So this is a great book here, How Learning Works, um, Seven Research-Based Principles for Effective Teaching, I think is the subtitle. Um, and so this is the, one of the um, arguments that they make here, that this is a key difference between you and your students, an expert learner being you, a novice learner being your students, is the density of connections among the concepts, facts, and skills they know. Um, as experts in our domain, um, we understand how to organize knowledge. As something new comes in, we know like what structures it goes in, or it sort of automatically slots into these larger networks of knowledge that we have. Students kind of just get things kind of, you know, coming in in isolation. So that's a major difference between us and our students. And that's the thing that we want to try and think about. How can we improve? A lot of this research has been done in physics, actually. Um, they have a great tradition of learning research in physics. And one of the things that um, physicists have discovered is that students can have completely contradictory notions about like how motion works, for example and be able to like solve problems or answer questions about both things and never notice that they contradict. And that is because of this same fact, that they have these two different things sort of in isolation from one another. So this is, again, just a couple other quotes in the book. Novices, um, when people's knowledge is disconnected, it doesn't have that coherence, they can hold and use contradictory propositions. And what that often means for us is, they can come into class with their sort of ways of thinking about, you know, initial uh, ways of thinking about your subject matter, learn something from you, and have it not change that sort of initial way of thinking because they don't see how it connects. Right? So for me, this often takes place in writing. Um, when I uh, come in and will teach students a writing skill, they can use it in my, you know, one context, but then they don't think to apply it in another class or in another, another type of paper. So the difference here is that this is what we do over here. We can, first of all, we see things, how things kind of chunk together and, and as, as things are coming in. And then we use those chunks to build these more interconnected knowledge structures. Okay? And that's a key difference between us and our students. The challenge is this. You can't just hand people connections. And so what we really have to do is create the framework that students can make their own connections in. And that's what this teaching strategy has to come down to. So there, we have to kind of be somewhere in the middle here, where we can kind of set up the framework, but the student has to come to that place where they can start to create their own connections. But this then becomes an interesting way to think about what we're doing in class when we are helping students try and expand their knowledge, when we're teaching them something new. Um, how can we help set up frameworks that students then can use to build their, make their own connections with the different things they're learning. And that includes like what they learn in the first week with what they're learning in the fifth week, what they learn in your class with what they learned last semester, what they're learning in class with what they're gonna learn, out, what they're gonna do with that material outside of class. The more of these connections that we can make, the more helpful we are gonna be to them in expanding their knowledge networks. So let's look at three examples of that uh, with a little bit of research behind them. Concept maps. 
Concept maps are a great connection building activity which have a lot of research behind them actually. So you'll see here um, uh, a, a meta-analysis of 55 studies on students who completed concept maps on a topic, higher levels of knowledge retention and transfer, being able to use it in a new context, which is what we ultimately want, compared to students who did all these other things. Right? So the simple act of a, having students make concept maps about a subject matter, right? which we all know what those are, right? You put something in the middle and then the students kind of build around it to relate. No, not everyone knows what kind of, okay. So a concept map, um, I should have had a visual representation of one. Um, a concept map is like um, where, you know, uh, let's say you take a, um, whatever concept the students are learning and it's kind of a way of creating a visual representation of that material. You know, there might be a box in the center with the main idea and then a line coming across and there's three like stacked ideas that are sub -tart. and then there's another line coming off that represents another area, right? So it's a way to ask them to kind of organize their knowledge visually. And that, Act is a connecting activity. It's asking them to start in some central place and then kind of build off it to the other different things that they know or they've learned. So you can actually ask them to use concept maps to map out like uh, something that they're learning, but you can also use them to map out connections between something that they've learned and other things. Right? So they can be used in lots of different and interesting and flexible ways. Does anybody here use concept maps that can give us an example? Great. Uh, so we'll like give you this example. I uh, sorry to put you on the spot. Is that okay? Yeah, that's fine. So this person is a concept map expert. <laughs> so like, what, what would be a, a place where you use that? So I put, for example, I put making connections in the center and then I'm in teacher education. So I said between the pedagogy and the theory classes that our students take, so making connections between those, and I want to see the connection between the theory and the practice to see and feel, and yeah. then looking at yeah, great. reflecting on their practice. And, yeah. Yeah. So there's lots of good uh, other theory, theories about why concept maps are effective. Um, but for me, this is the kind of interesting one here is this idea that it, it helps give them a, a chance to kind of build out their own connections between the course material and, and other things that they're doing or thinking about. By the way, this comes from another great website you should check out called ABL Connect. Um, it's a, a, a sort of a treasure trove of active based learning strategies searchable by discipline and, and activity type from Harvard University. Um, I think if you just look up ABL Connect, it stands for active based learning but also activity based learning. Um, so it's, it's, a great, uh, it's a great website for that. Okay, so concept maps are one kind of way to think about how to do this. Um, another way is to ask students to do something like a connection notebook. And a connection notebook is another closing activity that I like um, to think about as being useful both for retrieval but also for these connections. So this can be done both online or in a physical paper notebook in class. Um, in my class, students bring a, have to buy a separate notebook. It's a physical notebook they bring to class every day. And once or twice a week, class ends with a connection prompt, which looks something like one of these. What's the most important thing you learned today, and why does it matter? All right, so it's moving a little bit beyond just the most sort of most important concept. One way in which the day's content manifests itself on campus or in their home lives, right? So taking what is in it and throwing these threads out into these other areas of their lives. Identify a TV show, film, or book that somehow illustrates a course concept from class. This maybe is a little bit easier for me in literature, but you never know. You might be able to, you probably can have plenty of examples that you can think of, and so this is something that you might challenge your students to think about. Um, describe how today's material connects to last week's, right? That's a challenging thing. The students don't, oftentimes they're going week to week, right? That was last week, right? And this is this week, it's different. So getting them to try and start connecting across class periods. How does that day's material, this is my favorite one to do, actually. How does it connect to something you've learned in another course? Because that's what we promise students in these liberal arts colleges that we teach in, right? That this is what we're giving them. We're giving them an integrated education that, that, that helps them think deeply about all the connections between the different things they're learning. Well, unfortunately, they don't often think to do that unless we prompt them. So these kinds of prompts can be as precisely what can push students to get that kind of uh, integrated liberal arts education that we hope to help them achieve. So these are just quick examples, but these kinds of examples are the things that you can do um, 
and again, lots of different variations here. Five minute write at the end. Um, five minute discussion at the end. Five minutes to writing and then 10 minutes we talk about it, right? Um, I like to do that when I can, but that takes 15 minutes. And so that is a lot. Now we're e eating up a little bit more class period. But even the five minute connection, I have to tell you, Sometimes you know you teach and like everyone's just sitting there looking at you the whole time and you're just like, is, you know, is anything happening here? But do these connection notebooks and you will see some fascinating stuff emerge. Um, it's really been one of the, for me, the most um, it's heartening things that I've done in my own teaching because it just, uh, we were talking about one day um, the World War I poets um, who wrote these, wrote these poems about, um, you know, the experience of being sort of uh, a lot of, you know, being, um, sort of seduced by the glamour of war to sign up and then, and then dealing with trench warfare, which was awful, right? So there was all this, these poems about the, the gap between what they thought war was going to be like and what it was actually like. So we did a connection exercise that day, and I just said, tell me, you know, does this connect to anything in, in your own experience? And we did the five minute write, and then I had left the 10 minutes for discussion. That was the most fascinating 10 minutes of the semester. People were talking about how their siblings had gone to war and experienced this. They were talking about um, army ads they saw on television. That, I mean, just all kinds of fascinating stuff that I, I'm not sure they ever would have thought about, but I certainly never would have known about um, if I had if not, you know, asked them. And, and it was. It was fascinating to see how well they had absorbed those ideas and were able to put them to use. Um, there was a hand that went up over here. Oh, well, well yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Well, first of all, I like it because it is a sort of non-backpack packing up technique, right? You actually have to write for five minutes. Um, I mean, yeah, that's so I do collect them. I collect them three times a semester, just read through them, check, 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 and then they get their points for them if they do them. Um, and so this is, to me, it's another simple way to just make sure students are coming to class and they know that if they come to class, uh, they're going to get these points. If they don't come to class, they don't get these points, right? Um, so. Um, that's kind of how I, I mean, they, it's five minutes and they have to do the writing in that five minute period because otherwise they're not going to get those points. So um, I don't need, like conceptually, um, I think if you don't want them to just think about it, sort of checking a box at the end, right? Doing the discussion part of it a few times helps with that. Because then like they get to, I mean, I've found that they, like they, this is where they jump into the discussion much more than when I'm asking them to interpret, you know, Tintern Abbey or something. Um, that, then they're much more slow to kind of jump into class. When they've got these things written down, they're much more willing to kind of jump into that discussion. So, so maybe do it with the discussion a few times, and then you can start doing it without the discussion. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Small teaching. Just pick one. No, I'm just kidding. Um, um, well, again, I, you know, what I try to think about is these openings and closings. Is like I can, we can almost always grab five minutes from the beginnings or the ends. Um, and, but you don't need to do it every day also, right? Like so in my 75-minute class, um, I oftentimes will only do this once a week. Um, I'll do the connections once a week, and then on the other day, I might do the retrieval thing, right? So like, um, you, you know, like I said, do, doing... Do something, but you, you don't have to do all these things every time, absolutely. We're looking at kind of a menu of possibilities here. Yes? Oh, sorry, yeah. I think that we have these mics here, but yeah. So she's just saying, like, how do you find time for, I will repeat questions from now on. Thank you, though. Um, yeah, how do you find time for doing all these things, like retrieval and the connection? And the answer is sort of, you don't have to, right? <laughs> One or the other, or, you know, try and start. Um, Thinking about different options. Um, okay, so uh, we still haven't even gotten to the money slide yet, so we're on this one. So I'm going to show you one other one in a little bit more depth, um, and this is something called the minute thesis. This is a this is a, a review activity or a brainstorming activity or a creative thinking type of activity that is done, like I said, once or twice or semester, but it's something that can be done before any major activity assessment. So what you see here is an example of one um, time um, I used it in one of my classes, looking at romanticism. We have our authors here on the left that we read. Over here we have the themes that we talked about in class. I don't know if you can read those. It says, you know, natural world, revolution, et cetera. 
students get categories of things on the board. You have to think about what are those categories in my class. Categories of concepts or ideas, texts, problem types, whatever the case may be. Put them up on the board like that. Hand a student a marker and say, go up and connect. draw me a line that connects two of them. Every student gets one minute to think about a thesis, about how those two things connect. Writes it down, and then the, we have a brief discussion of it, five, ten minutes. And then another student gets the marker, goes up and circles another pair, right? And this can go on for as long or as short as you would like, but it's a way of getting them to start to see these things connect, as well as it's a great creative generator, right? Because a lot of times we know that creative thinking, what really often happens is people are just creating new and unusual connections between things, right? So this is kind of a forced way of walking students through that process. How do you connect unusual things? Well, try it and see if something is there. And sometimes there is nothing, right? But that's okay, we've learned that. But you'd be amazed how well students can, can do this when you prompt them, when you give them the frame, they can start to see the connections between all the different things that you're doing. So this, uh, like I said, for me, this is a great activity to do like you know, two, three times a semester. If you've got three five-week units, do it at the end of each unit. It's a great review activity. It gets them thinking about the con conceptually about the class um, and starting to connect things across um, the, different, um, the different things they've learned. OK, so let's finish this section here with our connection activity. Um, creating concept maps is obviously a first one that we saw. Um, and interesting thing, uh, some research suggests that using concept maps, just, just one is good, but if you can do like a second one that goes back over the same material and ask them to organize it in a new way, that's deepening their connections even more and giving them lots of opportunities or options for connections. Um, consider the paper or the digital connection notebooks that can also be used to prompt those end of class discussions. I think these um, a little bit, you know, I think these have more um, possibilities in the Blackboard side. What do you use? Blackboard? Yeah, like you, this is something I think that can be used more effectively in Blackboard than the retrieval practice stuff because that you really want them to be able to kind of uh, not just look it up. But here I think you could use your, your LMS uh, in order to create the you know, connection discussion threads or, or some other thing like that. Um, I, the, the reason I do like it though for class is because it does give you the chance to do that in class bit of as well, which is have a, let's talk about it for a few minutes before we finish here. Um, the minute thesis is uh, that last thing I showed you. Um, I think that's great for to review for an exam, to help students come up with presentations or project ideas. Um, oftentimes when I, we do the minute thesis in class, we usually do it in my class before they have to write a paper. I can see that the student's paper topic ultimately came from one of the things that they um, came up, and it's almost always something they came up with themselves, like a connection that they you know, saw, volunteered, and spoke about, and then they develop it ultimately into their paper. We all know that you know, sometimes when you ask students to write their own ideas about some topic, they get sort of paralyzed, right? And think, I, I'm not smart enough to do that. This is an easy way to help them see that. The last point I want to make is one that we didn't talk about yet. But thinking about what you provide to students in terms of your course material, like your lecture notes or your class notes or whatever, interesting research shows that like of three options, give them all your notes, give them none of your notes, give them the framework or the scaffolding and have them fill it in themselves, that produces the most learning. Because it's exactly what we've been talking about here, right? You, they get the outline, but they have to fill it in with their own connections and ideas. And that is the most effective. So if you're the kind of person that does even mini lectures, think about that. You could pr even just use the board for that, right? Write the outline on the board and then say, you know, you got, you have to sort of tell them, don't just sort of, you know, this isn't the whole thing. <laughs> you know, you've got to be, you can be filling in notes along the way, but the board or uh, paper outlines can help them, give them the framework that they fill in with their own connections. Okay, now, questions on this one? Or have they been asked already? Yes? Mm. No, but that's a really good idea. Um, I'm going to repeat that because you told me to repeat the questions and comments. Uh, um, having students look at each other's connection notebooks. Actually, you know what? That's a great thing to do, like 
write it down, look at somebody else's, then talk about it. That would be a great three-part structure. Have you tried something? Have you done something? Yeah. That's a great idea. I, I love it. Yeah. It's a small tweak to my small change. I like it. <laughs> Ah, oh, that's a great idea. So if they have that, so in that discussion, if they go back to, after the discussion, go back and rewrite something else. Um, yeah, elaborate on what they have already written. That's a great idea too. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. That that could certainly work as well. But I, I, it's fun when they do it, right? Like they start coming up with this stuff, and you're like, "Well, I hadn't." Yeah, that's the best part of teaching, right? When you see new things yourself as a result of class. Um, yeah. So obviously, you could do something like this as a, as a midpoint activity as well. Yes, back there. Um, sort of. <laughs> um, um, it depends on how much is on the PowerPoint slides, right? Like if, if it's full of everything that they, you know, should, I guess, yeah, I would favor giving it less, like, or having your PowerPoint version and then stripping some of that material off um, for the version that you give to them. Um, so that, you know, you might be able to just sort of have the headers or something like that or the key concepts and let them fill in the ideas. And that is so much of this stuff that at first they don't like. I mean, as you were just saying, at first they're just, you know, they can't do it. But we, and I, I know this. This is challenging with all this stuff. Um, you know, um, like I said, retrieval practice is so much more difficult than just looking at your notebook over again, which feels great, um, but it's a short term learning activity. So all I can say to people about this, when people raise this objection, is we have to just keep telling them why we're doing it. Like, and you know, be really clear, this is going to help you more than if I did it the other way. I know it's not in, quite as enjoyable, but we have to be just, if, if all of us are just continually transparent with students about the, our teaching and about the reasons for it, um, that's, I think, the best way we can deal with this. Well, I think like the connection notebooks are one, like I said, that I think lend themselves really well to something like this. Um, retrieval practice is a little bit harder in the online environment um, because they always can get access to their stuff, right? Um, the only way that um, Michelle, you know what, look at, have you seen that book, Minds Online by Michelle Miller? To take a look at this, she has some concrete suggestions for how to do retrieval practice in an online environment. One of the easiest and simplest ways is through time, um, you know, timing uh, the questions. Uh, there's only a certain amount of time you have to answer the question, which sort of forces people to, um, to answer them relatively quickly without being able to just sort of search for them. There's problems with that as well, but she, has, she does have some suggestions in there for, for, for that. So, so take a look at that book. It's called Minds Online, Michelle Miller. Yeah. Yeah, so that's another reason why I do like to address them somehow, right? And like why I like the, the conversation part of it as well. Um, and so um, it depends, right? So like in, it depends on this, this, part of this depends on class size. And I know that we all, um, you know, have, we, there's the ideal and then there's what we can actually do, right? So ideally, we would follow everyone with the discussion in which we can sort of address these things, right? Like and say, you know, well, that, that actually is a little bit different than what we've been talking about here. Um, we can do that when we do the discussion. In the actual notebooks, um, when I have time, I will write little notes to the side of the entries. Oftentimes, I, I'll just put check marks. But if I see something like that, I sometimes will try to address it. And then after I read them, I collect them three times a semester. Um, I usually will say a few things about connections I saw in the notebooks that either were really interesting or that seemed to me like that maybe weren't quite on point or something like that. So I think those are the only ways that we can do that. Um, like I said, there's the ideal, which we would address them all as they happen, but we, you know, 
there's the practical fact that we all have to live lives and we, <laughs> we can't be grading things or evaluating things constantly. Okay, we actually have one more thing to get through, a um, whole little chunk. We've only got about 20 minutes left, so um, let's get through this last one and then we'll have time to do a little bit of uh, final Q&A. This one will take a little bit less time. Okay, so what we're talking about for our last thing is how do we help students take a mastery orientation toward their learning? And a mastery orientation is contrasted with a performance orientation. Performance orientation means that students are focused on the doing well on the thing, right? I want to do well on the test. I want to get my A. Um, and we want students ultimately to take a mastery orientation, that, that we want them to be able to um, have an interest in learning the subject matter and gaining mastery over, over the, the course material. There's lots of research on what helps with that, and I'm only going to focus on one thread here. And that thread tells us that two things seem to be important. The first is that if students have a sense of control over their own learning. So this is a, uh, from a book uh, by a biologist who took an interest in, in, in learning and, and looks at sort of um, the biology of the brain. Uh, and, and how that influences our learning. It's called The Art of Changing the Brain is the book. Uh, and this is a, one of the, the key quotes from that book. We have to help learners feel they are in control. Now notice, by the way, there's a little weasel language in here, and that is to help them feel they have control. <laughs> we don't have to actually give them full control. We need to give them some sense that they have some control over the learning environment or the learning community. Uh, and this is a, a quote from a Journal of Ed Educational Psychology here. Um, this was actually a study, as a, I think, of K-12 classes, looking at different classes and, and the teaching environments and, and evaluating them according to whether they were more mastery or performance oriented. Those mastery oriented classes gave students that sense of control over the process of their learning or the product. Like, what did they do to demonstrate their learning? What was the ultimate uh, assessment? Now, this and second thing is kind of just a flip side of that, right? How do we do that? We give students some choices. And so how can we help think about how to give students choices? And again, this is from How Learning Works. Um, where possible, we want to allow students to choose among options and make choices with the goals that are consistent with what they find important. And again, you'll notice the weasel language in there, where possible. Right? Again, we're not talking about giving students endless choices. And again, from that, uh, a different article, actually, in the Journal of Ed Psych, um, giving choices, giving students some say in establishing priorities and task completion. So in other words, so what are they going to do to demonstrate their learning? How can we help give them some choices uh, in terms of how they demonstrate their learning to us? So this is the kind of theory here. The idea is that if we want students to take that mastery orientation, we have to give them some sense of control over their environment. And one way to think about that is how can we give them some choices? So let's look at three different ways to do that. And we're going to start with a kind of larger teaching initiative and then sort of go down to like a, um, more smaller opportunities. This guy is the first person that I became interested in as, as a choice giver. Um, John Boyer teaches this World Regions class at Virginia Tech with 2,500 students. So whenever you feel like you should complain about your large class sizes, Think of poor John up there teaching 2,500 students in his world geography class. That's the fall class. In the spring version, the small version, there's only 500 students in there. Um, so John, um, because who I profiled in my last book about cheating, because uh, in a positive way, <laughs> um, John explained to me that in a class of 2,500 students, you know, so in a class of 30 students, you give a midterm exam, one kid is sick, right? Or has a, an emergency or whatever. And then you have to think about, like, how am I going to help that student get a makeup? Well, when you've got 2,500 students in a class, that becomes a logistical nightmare. There might be, like, 100 students who have very legitimate reasons to miss any one exam. So he had, he had to think about, how can I deal with it? I can't, you know, he didn't have the ability to deal with this. He does have some TAs, by the way. Um, so, so, so what he said was, you know what? I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm going to give the students a menu of choices, and there's 1,500 available points in the class, but you only need 1,000 to get an A. And so the students get to choose which assessments they would like to complete in order to earn whatever grade that they're going to earn. And there are traditional tests and exams. There are quizzes. There is like a Twitter assignment. There are papers they can write. There are movie nights and responses they can go to. There's lots and lots of stuff. If you Google John Boyer World Regions, you'll get his syllabus is available online. Um, so you can see an example of how he does it. Now, this can be done in such a way that, and John does it, some things you can't avoid. There are some things that are enough points that if you want to earn even a passing grade, you have to do these certain things. So again, even though it seems like it's an endless choice, it's kind of an illusion. Um, this is the way John describes it in his syllabus. Anybody remember these books over here? When I was a kid, there were these books that you could read where it was like, 
If you want to you know, go to the mountains, turn to page 69. If you want to go to the river, turn to page 73. And then you kind of chose your adventure through it. So that's how John describes his syllabus. Instead of having a set amount of mandatory activities you're required to do, and notice how he's using that language of control and then sort of unleashing that, I'm going to provide you a host of opportunities to earn points toward your grade, allowing you to choose your path according to your own interests and skills. It's a create your fate grade. <laughs> you choose what you want to work on, okay, and, and keep doing things until you get where you want to get. Um, and so that idea is um, what I find interesting. Uh, it's, now, this is a, that's what I would call a big teaching idea, to change your whole system like that, which I have not done. Um, but I've started to think about now, how can I do some of this? How can I give my students some choices in terms of um, the kinds of things that they're going to do? Uh, and you might be able to think about this as well. Are there places where you might be able to offer some options of different types of things and let the students choose the one that they're going to be most interested in? rather than just making them all jump through the same set of hoops. Now some people, there's lots of, people in the K-12 world call this like, con, there's different names for it, contract grading. Yeah, is there other names for it? Uh, yeah, but uh, lots of people, yeah, yeah. So, I mean actually, by the way, John found with this that one thing he had to do that he didn't do initially was that students had to write out a contract at the beginning, because otherwise students got to the end and they had done nothing and they couldn't, they couldn't pass. So now, at the beginning of the semester, they sort of, first few weeks, they identify what it is that they're going to do. They make out a contract that then they have to follow. Okay, so that's our first one. Um, our second one is a, a guy who, uh, oh, you have a question? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> yeah, that's a great example of giving students some kinds of choices. And a, a, a perfect, like, small little example like that. Yes? Yeah. Oh, another great example. All right, good. So we have people here on this campus that are doing this kind of thing already, which is wonderful. Um, so, uh, so that's our first big example. Our second big example is this idea of not a blank syllabus, but having blank spaces on your syllabus that the students and you can fill in together after class has started. So this comes from um, a, a guy who has written about this in a couple of different places. Um, in an American lit, it's a, a literature class, um, he leaves some blank spots on the syllabus. And the student's first assignment is to look through the anthology, pick the poem that they would like to see in class, and their first essay is why should, why? Like why are we learning this? Why are we gonna learn this poem? And they lead the discussion on that day. Now this was my first encounter with this idea of leaving a blank space on your syllabus, but to me it's now become a much more interesting opening for again thinking about mastery. Are there some spaces on your syllabus, wherever they might be, like policies, content, assignments, where you can leave a little blank spot and say to the students, here's all the stuff we're doing, this is the course, but here's a spot where we're going to talk together about this. And then you know, in two weeks, we're going to work together to decide what goes in here. Right? That's a way of inviting students into a learning community rather than saying, you will follow all my rules and learn the things I tell you, right? which is what we typically do. Now, I experimented with this this semester um, for the first time. So I'll tell you how it went, <laughs> because it didn't go perfectly. Um, so I put a blank space in my course, 1,000 points. I had a 100 points that I left open. And I said this to them, you know, this is, let's talk together about what you want to do. We can do a paper if you'd like, because um, that's what we often do in literature classes. But we can do something different if you'd like. So, so we're going to try and come up with something, and what, whatever that will be, we'll, we'll, we'll do. So a few weeks into the semester, I was showing them a short video in class, a three-minute, like, background contextual video, which was just um, images, captions, and music. And it was giving them some background information about a historical event that, that was important for what we were doing. And they were like, can we do that? And so I said, yeah, that's a great idea. Let's do that. So we had, the, so we said, okay, three to five minute videos on historical context that is important for something that we're reading. I made a big list of topics that they could choose. Um, they were very excited about it, actually. They were really into it. Um, I had the IT people come in and show them how to do stuff on iMovies. Um, I had the librarian uh, link them to Creative Commons images that they could use. So it was a little bit of extra work on my part. Uh, and they made the videos. Here's a still from one of them um, that the students did about Queen Victoria and her attitudes towards feminism. 
Um, the problem was, so I'll tell you the problem was, just in case you go down this route, um, I hadn't thought clearly enough about what could go wrong in the videos. And a lot went wrong. And the first video w was terrible. And so, and I unfortunately made the, the really terrible decision to say, we'll just show the videos in class. And so the first video was shown in class, and there were a lot of problems with it. And so that was became a sort of situation I had to massage my way out of, because I didn't want to be like, that was terrible. <laughs> Do it differently, right? So I had to figure out my way to kind of get through this. So all of, if you try something like this, you think ahead about, like, you know, if you choose something that you haven't done before, or they choose something with something creative, you have to think carefully about, like, a rubric or, like, articulating the um, qualities of it. So, anyways, as you can see, I'm still trying all these things new myself. I'm, I'm going to do it again, though. I was very convinced about it. They were very into it. They were excited about it. And by the end of the semester, they were great. Um, I, this video is, is, was an excellent video. Um, it's had a bunch of other vi views on people um, watching it. So it's, it's great. They, they're excited. I'm going to do it. I'm going to leave that blank space on my syllabus and maybe even expand it a little bit. Now, the last thing I'll just point out, the last example I'll give you, because we're almost done here, um, because a lot of people will say, well, I can't, I don't, I, you know, I have to teach to a required thing. My students take external exams. I can't give up any of my content or let students have choices over that, which I totally get. Um, so here, I like to think about Kathy Davidson's idea of a class constitution. And that is inviting students to help you make the decisions about the rules and policies of the class and about how the community works together and learns together. So here's a simple way of thinking about this. You have a draft syllabus that you give out on the first day. And then you invite the students into conversation about some of these kinds of things. And then you finalize that syllabus after those conversations are concluded. So what is our policy going to be on devices in the classroom? When are they out? When are they not out? What is our policy going to be on late work? And maybe some student has been in that class of the five-day late policies and is able to make that suggestion to you, right? And you think it's a good idea. Um, what types of assignments are we going to collaborate? Do you want to work in groups on things? Do you not want to? Um, and they're not all going to agree, so this is going to be a discussion process, right? But that's an interesting way that your students are going to have to learn to kind of work through that. Will we use social media? Is there going to be extra credit? You can think about all these kinds of um, aspects of the class that are sort of peripheral but, but are important to the students a lot of times, right? These are things they often care about. So how can we invite them into that conversation and allow them to help us make the rules of our community, of our learning community? And to me, that's the most important signal it sends is, this is a community. I'm the leader, but we all have a voice in the community. OK, so our last slide here. Um, offering students choices in both the assessment system and within individual assessment system. Right? There's lots of different ways to do that. We've heard some examples here already. Leaving some blank space on that syllabus and providing students the opportunity to fill in that space. Allowing students to create a class constitution um, that will help determine some of the policies of the class. And the last point I make is kind of a warning to you, which is you've got to scaffold this a little bit. First year fall semester students are not going to be able to make as many choices or really want to make as many choices as seniors, right? So this is in a first year fall class, you might just invite them into a couple small decisions. You know, and as they gain more experience as students, as they have lots of experience with other teachers and they get other ideas about what a class might look like, they're going to have better ideas. They're going to make smarter decisions um, as they get a little bit further along. Um, so you, you have to just be careful about this, I think, and, and think about, you know, um, how you, you, you get this in, um, you put this technique into practice. Okay, questions about this one? Yes? So, well. Yeah. Yes, yes, that's a good, I, I've done a version of that. Um, the, the challenge I've found with that, which is there's some great research to show that um, sometimes I show it, and I didn't show it today, but about goal setting and about um, students setting their own learning goals in a class and that that has some, can ha in some context, can have positive learning benefits. The challenge sometimes is they don't often know at the very beginning enough to set a good goal. So I actually, if for that kind of activity, like to push it back a little bit so that's so that might be a harder one to do where you like 
incorporate it into a syllabus or something like that? Because like the Constitution thing, you can just do have that ready for the next second week or something. But the learning goals, I think sometimes, especially again, like new students, they're not really even going to know like enough about anthropology to to be able to set like a good learning goal at the beginning. So so I, I like that idea. I think it's really valuable. Uh, seniors can probably in a major class can do it. You know, they've chosen the class. They know what it's like and they know what the major is like. First year students might need to wait like a, a few weeks into it. Yeah. Self-assessment is great. I think we should be doing it as much as possible, as much as we can grade them, and as much, you know, I think uh, getting students to reflect on their learning is a great activity, and so um, that's something that is, can be easily done too in online um, environments where students can be making um, assessments of their own work. Um, students grading each other, I think that can be helpful. I think it's a little bit more, um, you know, self-assessment is something that's good for developing your own sort of metacognitive skills, which I think is something that we know is really important for learning. Um, I, you, you don't get quite that same level of benefit, I don't think, from peer grading, but I think it has, it has potentially other benefits. So I'm, I'm in favor of both those things in, in limited ways. Um, yeah. For the classroom, yeah. do you have a whole criteria on that? Do you do it? Like, yeah, like. Do you see the consensus? Is it by age? Like, people go to what they like best? How does it However you want. <laughs> Yeah, I know. Um, for me, this is something that takes maybe like a well. The um, the example I showed you was something that took. I actually said at the beginning of class, I, uh, for the same reason I said um, we're going to wait to and make this decision for a few weeks in because I want you to see what the options are and what kinds of things we're doing. So I actually didn't. I, I just had to explain it at the beginning. For the constitution idea, I think that's something that you can do in like a half hour. You know, if it's in the beginning of a seventy-five minute class. You know, that's something that you could be doing, or in the second class or something like that. Half hour, you know, give students a chance to talk about it. And I, if I, um, it's been two years, yes, yeah, so I, I haven't, I didn't do that class constitution last, in my last class. But when I have done it, it was like a half hour in the first week of the semester. Um, just inviting them into some simple decisions like that. And they did it, we talked in groups first, and then, and then we talked about it as a whole. So, yeah, there's no, there's no perfect way to do that. Um, I liked doing the groups first just so they could see, like, everyone could speak and they could see what each other thought. So that some, sometimes what, if you do something like this, you just say, everybody, what do you think? This first strong-willed kid is going to raise his hand and say, no extra credit. And then everyone's going to go, okay, no extra credit, right? So, like, the groups gives everyone a little bit of a chance to have the voice. Yeah. I would just add on the scaffolding, um, on your comment about earlier students not knowing maybe what some of the ideas would be or some of the good choices. I've been doing for years, students can choose either to do three small papers that focus them on practicing techniques on smaller topics or one large top paper where they can really dig into a research. So I let them choose early on in the class and they do a mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. make a decision. Yeah. What do you want me to do? Yeah. And just weren't at a, even, like, from their experience in high school and grade school, weren't equipped to know what to do with that kind of decision. Yeah. I should have kind of walked them a little bit more through. Yeah, yeah. So it's more a personal than a kind of a, a even a, a knowledge based lack there. Yeah. They weren't there yet. Yeah, and that's just been my experience too. The freshmen don't, the first year, first year students don't, they don't. They don't want it to quite this, uh, that much power yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, they had to. They had, yeah, they had to write. They had to write the paragraph, um, in which they turned in with the video, so that I could check exactly for that. So they had to write like the caption. They had to put turn in a sheet which had all the images, 
um, the ca where they came from. They had to write out the text. And in fact, I did have an initial, uh, after the initial sort of disaster, they then, everybody had to turn in a draft. And on one of those drafts, um, I saw a quote, which was like, this is language too sophisticated for these kids. And, and in fact, they had pulled it from a website. I think not like in a deliberate effort to cheat. They just thought, well, this is the caption for this image. And so that gave me a chance to talk about it and tell them they had to go back and write their own and talk to the whole class about it. So, yeah. And so to me, this is just one more reason to do daily retrieval practice and that um, if the students are not preparing that the, 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 I, we, I don't call them quizzes, I call them writing exercises, but students have to come in every day and write a one paragraph response to the reading. Um, and they are graded like a quiz. Uh, they look like a quiz, but they're called writing exercises. Uh, and the idea is that they, it's, a question, it's a thought question about the reading that they will have to have done the reading to answer, but it goes beyond just memorization. So that, to me, is the only real solution that we have for this. They have to be held responsible for it. But not just in like a sort of, I'm watching over you, because it is good for them. It helps them learn. If, they've, you know, if they come in at the beginning and they're asked to retrieve what it is or you know, and do something with it, it's good for them. So I am a big believer in um, you know, sort of daily accountability exercises for, for students, because um, it helps them. It helps them, and, and they're, they're much better prepared at the end if they've done that. And as you say, they do the reading. I mean, th that forces them to do the reading. And you know what? In the end, as I always say to the students at the beginning of the semester, the easiest way to get an A in this class is to just do the well on the writing exercises, because they add up. There's like one almost every class period. So they end up being like you know, 20% of the grade. And if you just read and do the writing exercises, you get an A on 20% of your grade. They figure that out really quickly. Um, and so, especially the, some of them at the beginning don't do them, they start getting zeros, and I will sometimes write a little note, say, you got to be careful here, you know, these are going to start to add up, and immediately those kids start reading. Um, so that's the only way I know to do this. There maybe are more creative people in the world who have better solutions to this, but that's my only, my only strategy. Yes, one more comment, because we're at 10.30. Oh, yeah. And then by the end of the semester, the large majority of the children in the class are reading the option. Absolutely. That is exactly what I have found. My, our teaching evaluations have a question. What's the most helpful thing that the student did? 50% of them say they're writing exercises every semester, even though, as you say, at the beginning, they're like groaning every time they have to do them. By the end of the semester, they know this was the best thing that like helped me get ready for the final exams or the papers or whatever. So, okay, the last thing that I asked in this small teaching fashion, you've got your index card. What is the one change you would like to make to that class based on what we talked about today? Just take one minute, just write a little note to yourself, and then I will let you go. Right. As a good little um, you know, structural change or something you'd like to try, what's one change you'd like to make to that class next semester? All right, good luck with your teaching. I hope you can, the rest of the day, can continue to think about small changes that you made. Thank you.